So, um, again, but, uh, on, for the people that are watching uh, via the uh, Internet, uh, I'm going to introduce Rick Lifton. He's going to present on behalf of the Center for Mendelian Genomics uh, Consortium. Rick is a former member of this advisory council, and he is the Sterling Professor of Genetics and Chair of Genetics at Yale University. He's also an HHMI investigator and a grantee of the Centers for Mendelian Gen Genomics program. And um, welcome back, Rick. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be uh, back to see a bunch of old friends and have the opportunity to uh, speak today on behalf of the Centers for Mendelian uh, Genomics. Uh, we've been running for uh, two and a half years, and the centers uh, are composed of uh, the University of Washington Center, uh, the Yale Center, and a combined center uh, from Johns Hopkins uh, and Baylor. And if we think about uh, what the goals, not necessarily the goals uh, of uh, uh, in the first funding session, but I think we have uh, eliminated most of the barriers to understanding uh, the contribution uh, and causes of uh, all human monogenic uh, disorders. Uh, and this writ large ought to be uh, among the challenges uh, that we see in, in this field going forward. So if we just think for a moment about the importance of uh, and impact of Mendelian genetics, uh, certainly uh, rare mutations with large effect uh, provide uh, very fundamental insights into human biology uh, that allow diagnostic testing for important, uh, that are important for disease uh, prevention, therapy, and prognosis, and we heard a lot about this uh, in the last session, but certainly the discovery of uh, BRCA1 and some of the other mismatch repair genes in colon cancer leave little doubt about clinical utility following discovery. Similarly, the uh, ability to use rare mutations with large effect to identify tractable therapeutic targets uh, has really been a boon to the pharmaceutical industry uh, and a number of targets that are under active development uh, in industry have come from uh, the recognition of distinct phenotypes from uh, rare mutations. NAV1.7 in pain, ROMK in blood pressure, PCSK9 in LDL cholesterol, uh, the orexin pathway in sleep, uh, the amyloid precursor protein uh, pathway in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the ability to make bone mass uh, by inhibition of uh, 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 SOST with monoclonal uh, antibodies. These all came from rare Mendelian traits. Uh, and the ability to see what the clinical impact uh, might be of these rare mutations, uh, coupled with also the knowledge of uh, what adverse effects do or do not occur with rare uh, variants of large effect, uh, are really motivating factors for understanding uh, more of these in the human population. So if we just think broadly about the status of Mendelian genetics, uh, we focus largely uh, on uh, the protein coding uh, region because that is where most of the business that we have recognized to date uh, has occurred. Of course, does not mean that that will always be the case. But simply to make the point that there is a lot of discovery that remains to be done, there are about 21,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. Uh, and only about 3,000 of these have been uh, linked to about 4,000 Mendelian phenotypes. Uh, and so not to put too fine a point on it, even if we uh, allow for 15 to 30 uh, percent homozygous uh, embryonic lethality, uh, there's an awful lot of genes that haven't been accounted for uh, by, uh, from uh, rare mutations to date. So there's a lot of opportunity for new discovery in coding regions. And of course, this leaves 99% of the genome uh, uh, open for discussion as to what we might find when we get around to actually being able uh, to, in a cost-effective uh, way, investigate uh, the rest of the 99% of the genome. But re what really has motivated uh, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics was the recognition five years ago that the cost of DNA sequencing had come down six orders of magnitude and that we really ought to be able to tackle problems that we hadn't been able to previously. Uh, and this then led to the recognition that one could uh, fairly effectively and cost effectively uh, sequence the coding regions of uh, the genomes uh, rapidly and inexpensively. And of course, this is the language of the genome that we do understand. And we're not very good at uh, reading that language, but we're better than we are at the rest of the genome. So uh, many of us thought we would be able to use this to fairly rapidly begin uh, expanding our understanding of uh, the consequences of rare variation. So uh, the centers uh, are, have converged on fairly similar platforms and analysis uh, strategies uh, and are currently uh, largely sequencing about six exomes uh, per lane on the HiSeq Illumina platform. Uh, 
There's new technology that's coming out this year that will continue to evolve uh, the capability. Uh, but you can do this uh, at uh, high sensitivity and high specificity uh, for quite low cost. And at Yale, we're at about $500 uh, per exome. And I think that's a, a pretty good standard. Uh, after you amortize the cost of the uh, equipment, include all the labor uh, and the uh, cost of data production and storage. So the field really got its uh, founding back in about uh, 2009. Uh, with two papers that appeared in short order from uh, uh, groups that are involved in the Centers for uh, Mendelian uh, Genomics uh, at Yale making a clinical diagnosis and at University of Washington identifying the cause of a Mendelian disorder. Uh, the group at, at Baylor and Hopkins have very broad and deep uh, uh, contributions to uh, the field of Mendelian genomics uh, and I think these centers have uh, really put together quite a strong uh, program. So if you think about where would we be looking for new Mendelian uh, diseases? Well, certainly, if you go to uh, the online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, you'll find about 1,700 uh, Mendelian traits that have been reasonably well characterized but have not yet been solved. So those are fairly obvious substrate for uh, new investigation. But we think that that is really the tip of the iceberg because there are parts of the genetic landscape that have been unapproachable for, uh, until the advent of uh, this new uh, high throughput uh, technology. Uh, so for example, there are uh, a number of extreme phenotypes that arise from consanguineous union. Whether you typically do not get enough information for mapping, either because you only have a couple of individuals with these extreme phenotypes and you can't adequately map the locus, or there's high locus heterogeneity, so every little family that you uh, study has a different gene as its cause and mapping approaches have not been successful. A second area that uh, we think is quite attractive are potential dominant reproductive lethals. So if you have a dominant trait that is uh, reproductively lethal every time it occurs, those mutations are virtually always going to be de novo and there's almost, there's no mapping information there unless you're fortunate enough to capture a deletion that localizes uh, uh, the uh, uh, location of a disease gene. And then uh, increasingly uh, apparent are that there are diseases uh, that uh, uh, feature, uh, uh, that are commonly caused by somatic mutations other than the classic cancer syndromes uh, that we all already know about. So we think that there's a lot of ground for uh, opportunity. And uh, what I want to tell you about in the brief time is some of the prog progress that's been made. So key to this effort has been patient recruitment. And uh, uh, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics have uh, worked through a very extensive worldwide network of collaborators. Uh, there's been a small contribution from a web portal where anybody can go online, say, I've got interesting samples. Are you guys interested in sequencing? But this makes up a small fraction of uh, the total number of samples that have been uh, recruited for this study. Uh, there currently are more than 400 collaborating investigators from more than 25 countries worldwide on five continents. And collectively across the uh, three uh, centers, uh, we've recruited uh, more than 17,000 index cases uh, in the two and a half years uh, that, uh, this, uh, that we've been funded. This covers about 800 different uh, disease entities, but depending on how you define that, it could be a little bit less or a little bit more. So in terms of progress to date in the two and a half years, uh, we've sequenced uh, more than 12,000 exomes for this project, have published uh, 84 manuscripts, including gene discovery papers in Nature Science, Cell, Nature Genetics, New England Journal, American Journal, Human Molecular Genetics. These include reports of 60 new disease loci and genetic disorders. Uh, and it's estimated uh, that uh, there are about 200 more uh, disease genes and traits that have been identified and are as yet uh, uh, being worked up. And as you know, uh, in order to have uh, high impact papers these days, a lot of functional data is required. And many of our collaborating investigators are in the process of uh, pursuing these. I want to make the point uh, that our mode of interaction with our collaborators depends on the collaborator. Our favorite collaborators are the ones who say, you give me the data, I'll do all of the sequencing, all of the downstream work, write the paper, and do it themselves. That's wonderful. That's music to our ears, and we have many investigators who are capable of doing that.
We also have investigators who are completely clinical, who have no molecular capabilities, but they're very shrewd at recognizing interesting phenotypes. And they come to us and say, I've got an interesting cohort or an interesting group of families. I know that this is distinct from any of the disorders that I've seen previously and would love to collaborate with you. And we do the sequencing and do the analysis and, uh, and do most of the follow-up work uh, within the centers. So it really depends on the nature of uh, the collaborating investigators. So I want to give a few examples. To start with, classic Mendelian syndromes where people have recognized that there are new disorders, there are disorders that have not yet been solved. Uh, this is one uh, such example. Uh, this is a, a group of disorders, uh, spondylometaphyseal uh, uh, dysplasia. Uh, and these patients are unique in that they also have cone rod uh, dystrophy, suggesting that this was different than any of the other disorders in this class. Uh, so, uh, Classic uh, segregation suggesting uh, recessive trait and exome sequencing fairly quickly identified uh, mutations in uh, this gene, PYCT1A, uh, in uh, six unrelated uh, pedigrees. Independent mutations that co-segregate with a trait that leave no doubt that uh, this is the uh, uh, gene that causes this disorder. Uh, and this gene is of uh, known function. Uh, it's involved in the classic uh, pathway in the biosynthesis of uh, phosphatidylcholine. And homozygous loss of function mutation uh, are the cause of uh, this trait with short stature and uh, this cone rod uh, dystrophy. Uh, and this was published uh, this spring. Similarly, uh, mutation in a very interesting story in a, a mechanosensory uh, channel, uh, PISO2, uh, caused three related uh, phenotypes uh, that are related, uh, related in having uh, contractures of the hand and feet, uh, have variable associated features, uh, sometimes with cleft lips, sometimes uh, without uh, deep set eyes. Uh, and it turns out that uh, these patients in the study of uh, 35 families uh, the 35 families with 13 different mutations uh, in this gene that cause uh, uh, different uh, phenotypes along this spectrum. And there's quite striking genotype-phenotype correlation uh, on this spectrum with patients that have one particular uh, mutation uh, being particularly prone to having cleft palate. And if you don't have that particular mutation, uh, you don't have that uh, particular clinical feature. Again, published uh, this spring. So, there are many more diseases that we've studied and characterized the molecular cause of that were previously recognized as be being a clinical syndrome. Uh, but there are many more in which the clinical syndrome has not been previously described, but the genetics has driven the recognition of the clinical syndrome. Uh, and one that was published uh, this month on the cover of uh, Cell came from two groups in uh, the Centers for uh, Mendelian Genomics. And both groups, uh, the two groups independently, identified the same mutation resulting from a founder mutation uh, that occurred about 16 generations ago in Turkey. They succeeded in identifying nine distantly related kindreds that all shared the identical recessive mutation segregating uh, with uh, a distinctive uh, trait. So the mutation is in a gene uh, CLIP1, which is a kinase that is required for tRNA splicing. And uh, it's recessive loss of function mutation prevents uh, splicing of virtually all tRNAs with the accumulation of uh, uh, improperly spliced tRNAs, activation of uh, uh, oxidative stress uh, signaling pathways. And the results are an interesting constellation of neurologic uh, phenotypes. So looking at the, the MRIs of a normal uh, and affected individuals, the affected individuals uh, have microcephaly. They have large uh, ventricle as a consequence, uh, uh, fluid-filled ventricles. They have uh, hypoplasia of the corpus callosum, you can see, compared to normal. They have hypoplasia of the pons. They have profound loss of uh, uh, the, and cerebellar mass. Uh, and again, uh, the magna cisterna uh, enlarged as a consequence of uh, the hypoplasia. Uh, so uh, these mutations are uh, recessive, apparently loss of function uh, mutations. Uh, and uh, the phenotypes have been mimicked uh, uh, in both uh, fish and in mouse demonstrating the consequence of uh, these mutations. Just uh, this week in the New England Journal of Medicine, another uh, one-of-a-kind family uh, with uh, a, a regional phenotype from extended families uh, uh, in Iran uh, who are segregating a, a unique phenotype of early onset coronary artery disease uh, with age of onset around fo age 44, uh, obesity, mean body mass index of uh, 33, 
uh, hypertension and uh, diabetes. Uh, and 25 affected individuals all share the identical haplotype uh, and uh, mutation in uh, this dual specificity uh, uh, kinase uh, DIRK1B. And uh, not much is known about the biology of DIRK1B, but one of the uh, findings uh, published in this paper demonstrated that uh, this appear, appears to be an activated, a, a, a gain of function mutation uh, in that the mutant uh, DIRK1B uh, promotes increased uh, adipogenesis uh, in 3T3 cells uh, in culture. And there are several other interesting uh, phenotypic effects of uh, this mutation. So again, uh, recognized to be a potentially Mendelian trait, uh, and the genetics uh, help to establish that. Similarly, going to areas where genes have previously been found, but there are leftover uh, patients and families that are not yet explained, has led to the identification of a number of uh, disease genes. And this is uh, one example, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So there are a number of genes in the complement cascade that have been identified as underlying uh, this uh, uh, thrombotic uh, phenotype. Uh, and yet there are patients who are unexplained. And uh, this led to uh, exome sequencing of these patients. And uh, uh, this has turned out to define a unique uh, clinical subset of patients who present in the first year with uh, hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, uh, kidney failure, and episodic recurrences. Uh, they progress to kidney failure by age 15. Importantly, immediately from a clinical standpoint, these patients uh, uh, do not respond uh, typically to anti-complement treatment, but they're unlike patients with uh, uh, the complement problems, uh, they are cured by renal transplant. So this uh, immediately has clinical implications for the patients who have uh, these mutations. The mutation that causes uh, this syndrome is recessive loss of function mutation in diacylglycerol kinase uh, epsilon. Uh, and DGKE is involved in the metabolism of diacylglycerol to phosphatidic acid. And in the absence of this enzyme, you have uh, elevated levels of uh, diacylglycerol, uh, which is a potent activator of protein kinase C in the professional thrombotic cells, uh, the endothelial cells, and platelets. So, uh, and this is uh, known to be activating for uh, thrombosis. So we think we can explain the pathogenesis of this disease uh, from this mutation. So we've also been able to identify a number of mutations and mechanisms that would have been very difficult to imagine solving in, in prior er, uh, eras. Uh, and one, uh, I think, very interesting example uh, is a form of fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, uh, in this case, uh, type 2, FSH uh, uh, D2. So FSH D1 is known to be caused by mutation on chromosome 4 uh, at the DUX4 locus. So DUX4 is a homeobox transcription factor, and it's normally only expressed in the germline and is methylated in somatic tissues, and it's found in a tandem array on chromosome 4. And there is a facilitating allele in which DUX4 has uh, a uh, polyadenylation sequence uh, that's present that allows it to uh, be expressed uh, in, in somatic uh, cells. Uh, and in conjunction with a, a mutation that causes hypomethylation at, at the chromosome 4 locus, uh, this is sufficient to cause uh, this uh, FSHD1. But there are patients who have a clinically indistinguishable syndrome, FSHD2, who do not have this contracted uh, uh, array at uh, cro the chromosome 4 locus, suggesting that there might be a second locus that modifies this uh, that enables uh, the phenotypic uh, uh, disease to be expressed. And that turns out to have been identified by exome sequencing of these patients, uh, which has uh, identified mutations uh, in the gene SMCHD1 uh, uh, in 15 uh, uh, patients, 15 of 18 patients uh, with this uh, phenotype. So they have the normal array, they have the polyadenylation signal, uh, but they have to have uh, this mutation in uh, SMCHD1 uh, uh, in order to display the phenotype. And they have the phenotype because this gene is required for the normal methylation of that locus. And so in the absence of that, you have a facilitating mutation at the chromosome 4 locus in conjunction with this mutation that causes it to no longer be fully methylated. Uh, you get this phenotype where this gene is now expressed in uh, muscle cells. And this leads to uh, activation of uh, a pathway 
uh, that uh, causes expression of genes that are normally expressed only in early development and leads to uh, death of uh, skeletal muscle cells. Further, somatic mosaicism has become apparent to underlie a number of uh, uh, monogenic uh, disorders. And there are several examples that have come out of uh, the work in the Centers for Mendelian Genomics uh, thus far. Uh, one of these is a defect in glycosylation. And there are many defects in glycosylation that have been uh, described. And this is a nice demonstration where combined biochemistry identifying patients who don't fit uh, with uh, uh, known uh, syndromes led to recognition of a uh, unique uh, syndrome featuring loss of both uh, galactose and sialic acid from multiple branches of complex uh, uh, type N glycans and led to exome sequencing which led to recognition of uh, unique uh, uh, loss of function mutations in uh, this uh, uh, UDP galactose transporter. And uh, strikingly, in all of the patients that have been identified with this mutation, the mutation is uh, somatic mosaic. And so in males, this is an excellent gene. Uh, in males, uh, you find a residual wild type sequence uh, on the excellent gene uh, in con in along with this mutation. And the assumption is that uh, you can't uh, be hemizygous null for this gene. There are tissues that absolutely require this, uh, uh, the wild type gene in order for, uh, for survival uh, to persist. Uh, but uh, in the presence of this mutation, uh, you end up with uh, selective defect in particular organs that are compatible with survival, uh, but leave, uh, uh, leave patients with intellectual disability, seizures, and uh, uh, other uh, afflictions. Similarly, a new spectrum of disorders that I think are particularly interesting has come from the recognition of somatic mutations in the skin. The skin obviously is a great uh, candidate for looking for somatic mosaicism because you can actually see the defect uh, in the skin. And it turns out that quite remarkably, uh, there are three distinct uh, skin lesions that all arise from activating mutations in RAS. Well, we've known about RAS uh, mutations since 1983. One might have thought we knew everything that we were, uh, needed to know about uh, RAS, uh, but it turns out that uh, there are three distinct lesions, nevus sebaceous, uh, these cutaneous nevi that give this waxy yellow appearance with uh, alopecia, uh, and these are associated with mutations in either HRAS or KRAS, and classic activating uh, mutations. There's a second quite distinct uh, phenotype featuring uh, an epidermal neva, neva syndrome, but in addition, this striking woolly hair. And it's hard to appreciate from this image, but there are these tight little spirals of woolly hair uh, in this, uh, that are heterogeneous in the background of this otherwise completely straight hair. And if you take these, uh, th these, uh, uh, the hair follicles and uh, do PCR on the, on the uh, straight and the woolly hair, uh, there's a mutation in RAS uh, unique to the woolly hair that is not found uh, in the wild type hair. And the patients that have been identified thus far all have the identical mutation in HRAS. And then lastly, there's a, a, feature, a, a syndrome of uh, cutaneous uh, nevi, and you can see that they follow these uh, dermatome uh, lines, uh, indicating that these are uh, resulting from the same uh, uh, somatic uh, mosaic uh, uh, mutation, likely. But they're also associated with renal hypophosphatemia, where the kidney can't hang on to phosphate, uh, owing to elevated levels of FGF23 a syndrome that has been characterized uh, as caused by mutation in a variety of genes, but quite strikingly in these patients, this dis both features, uh, the skin features as well as uh, the dysplasia in bones associated with uh, renal hypophosphatemia, uh, comes from uh, somatic mutations uh, in HRAS uh, or NRAS uh, and G13R or Q61R mutations uh, in these uh, two. Uh, and this mutation is actually present in the dysplastic bone as well as in the skin. Uh, and, we th and FGF23 is uh, expressed in the bone, not in the skin. So we think we know where the uh, uh, phenotypic effect of these mutations uh, lie. So these are uh, examples of new somatic uh, syndromes. Thinking about de novo mutations and where we might go to find de novo mutations that haven't been previously uh, described, uh, severe diseases that uh, impair reproductive uh, fitness seem obvious uh, targets. And so in collaboration with uh, NHLBI, uh, we sequenced a large cohort of uh, uh, patients with severe congenital uh, heart disease. 
uh, disorders of the heart that uh, typically do not survive uh, the first year of life uh, without surgical uh, intervention. And we thought these were good candidates for uh, uh, de novo mutation. And uh, in this study, we took advantage of the fact that we can actually get uh, developing heart tissue from the mouse and sequenced uh, uh, in uh, John and Cricket Seidman's lab at Harvard, uh, sequenced the uh, RNA in uh, the developing mouse heart and identified uh, the top uh, uh, quarter of genes expressed uh, in the developing uh, mouse heart uh, compared to the bottom quartile and then asked what is the frequency of de novo mutation in parent offspring trios uh, in these uh, kindreds and found an excess of de novo mutations in genes expressed in the developing heart. Getting back to Jim's point, we're not very good at identifying from missense variants which variants are pathogenic and which are simply neutral. So as we enrich, uh, we think for damaging mutations by going from all missense mutations to missense mutations at completely conserved uh, positions plus damaging mutations, and then uh, just the uh, overtly damaging premature termination, frame shift, uh, and uh, splice site mutations, there's an increase in odds ratio, uh, and all are uh, significant. Uh, but most strikingly, these uh, mutations, which are virtually all heterozygous, converge on chromatin modification, and uh, there are, uh, there's an, uh, a notable increase in enrichment in genes involved in chromatin modification, and in particular, modification at, uh, two, uh, at three uh, positions, H3K4 methylation, H3K27 methylation, and H2BK120 uh, ubiquitination. And there are mutations that introduce uh, methylation at this site and remove methylation at this site, mutations that uh, increase ubiquitination and remove uh, ubiquitination. Uh, and importantly, ubiquitination at this position is required for methylation at H3K4. So we think that uh, uh, this is a compelling pathway for, uh, that's involved in congenital heart disease and strongly suggests that this is a very dosage sensitive pathway. A little bit too much, a little bit too little, uh, and you get uh, phenotypic effects. We anticipate that uh, these will quite be quite variable in their phenotypic manifestations as well as their penetrance, but of course we're driven by identifying cases, that we're ascertaining cases. So again, getting back to our earlier point, we don't at this point know much about what the uh, penetrance of these variants would be, uh, except to say that uh, about 10% of congenital heart disease in this study appeared to uh, be attributable to de novo mutations. And then uh, lastly, uh, combining both the somatic mutation and de novo mutation, uh, we have uh, the unusual occurrence of identifying patients with ger de novo germline mutations or the identical mutations uh, in uh, benign tumors. Uh, and these uh, tumors cause aldosterone uh, production in the absence of the normal stimuli for aldosterone, resulting in hypertension. And these patients with germline mutations, where every cell in the body has these mutations, also develop uh, primary aldosteronism. Uh, but in addition, they have profound uh, problems due from seizures uh, and complex neuromuscular disease because this same calcium channel uh, is used in uh, the brain uh, and in other parts of uh, the body. These mutations electrophysiologically are activating mutations. They are activated at less depolarizing potentials. This is the normal mechanism by which aldosterone production is regulated. And one of these mutations also impairs inactivation of uh, this channel. So in this quick tour through uh, what we've been up to, what I've tried to show you is that uh, uh, we're succeeding in recruiting interesting patients, analyzing them and identifying interesting mutations that are providing new insights into uh, biology. And I think they point uh, toward a future where we really have the ability to start thinking about uh, in a coherent way of determining the consequence of mutation in uh, every gene in the genome. And uh, there's a commentary in Science just last week uh, on this point. Uh, just to look at uh, our data in uh, the first 2,000 Swedes we sequenced uh, at the start of uh, this work, uh, we found uh, a new gene with a homozygous loss of function mutation in about 1 in 18 of these subjects. If we do the same uh, experiment in the offspring of first cousins, uh, we find uh, instead a new homozygous loss of function mutation in almost every patient that we sequence. So there clearly is a path there that suggests uh, a way to try to identify mutation in every gene in the genome. Uh, 
and of course, the trick there in a, this genotype-driven screen would be how to append a phenotype uh, to those individuals. And uh, that is, a ch is challenging, and it requires careful thought as to how you ascertain your patients uh, if you were to try to do this uh, kind of study. So I think uh, among the lessons that we have learned uh, thus far in the two and a half years that uh, we've been running uh, is uh, I think we all are impressed that there is no substitute for both uh, clinical domain and genetics uh, expertise. Uh, and I think our general experience has been the people who have been successful in identifying interesting families uh, that have uh, novel genetic disorders in the past are very likely to come to you with interesting things uh, uh, that uh, will turn out to uh, yield uh, interesting results. Uh, and uh, that, of course, is uh, difficult to uh, universalize, uh, but uh, we've been quite impressed with uh, the talent, uh, the specific talent of our clinical uh, uh, collaborators from around the world. It's clear that extreme phenotypes from consanguineous union will continue to be fertile ground for discovery of new recessive loci. It's also clear that some of the traits that we have studied have extremely high locus heterogeneity. One of the largest projects that we've done uh, uh, across the CMGs has been uh, cerebral malformations of the brain. We've sequenced uh, collectively about 1,000 patients with uh, congenital malformations of uh, uh, the cerebral cortex. Uh, there are probably about 70 new genes that have come out of that uh, set. Uh, but uh, it's striking how few recurrent, uh, how the gene burden at any individual locus remains uh, quite small. Uh, and this then raises the uh, potential for rapid functional screening uh, using uh, CRISPR in model systems, for example, to try to, if you have a gene that causes microcephaly in a human, you make a CRISPR mutant uh, in a mouse or a fish, uh, you may be able to rapidly decide which genes are likely uh, uh, worth going forward with. Haploinsufficiency due to de novo mutation ap appears to play a significant role in several congenital disorders. The work that I described on congenital heart disease, there's further work on uh, 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 congenital abnormalities in kidney development, and there's uh, existing work uh, from the groups at Yale and Washington and autism that have not been part of uh, this uh, project that point in the same direction. I think uh, going forward, there clearly is a need for extensive worldwide collaboration uh, as well as uh, data sharing. Uh, and these, of course, raise as many issues as uh, we can hope to solve uh, this afternoon. But I think I'll stop there with uh, thanks to all of my collaborators uh, uh, at uh, University of Washington, uh, at Baylor and Hopkins, uh, and at Yale. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, Jim. So that's really neat stuff. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts were. I know you guys are predominantly pursuing whole exome sequencing, right? I was wondering what your thoughts were about you know non-genic regions, and and I, are there any data to suggest that that's the answer may lie there in some? So I'm so glad you asked because we are at this uh, wonderful uh, transition point where up until you know the last year, uh, if you had asked this, I would have said, well, yeah, we could think about that, but uh, it's so expensive and so arduous to think about. And we now have a practical experience of going down this road with a number of disorders and find that at the end of the day, there are some patients who look either the same or, more interestingly, a little bit different where we haven't found anything in the exome. And these are the kinds of things that we're really enthusiastic about going after whole genome sequencing. Uh, you know, if you were to go through all of OMIM and ask, at the end of the day, after linkage has been found, right, so how many well-mapped Mendelian loci are there where after going through everything, you're left with nothing in your hands? And that number is, qu is very small. We can probably count that on uh, two hands, the number of loci in which mutations are exclusively outside uh, the protein coding part of uh, the genome. So that is not to say that there will not be uh, more interesting mutations uh, that cause large phenotypic effects uh, outside the exome. Uh, 
but my own view is that uh, those will be somewhat, uh, will have to be somewhat selective in how we deploy uh, that technology. But we're very enthusiastic, uh, particularly in these cases where we think we've excluded the obvious uh, uh, mutations in genes and we're left with nothing and we think uh, whole genome is an obvious thing to do in that setting. And then real quick, if I can just follow up. Um, you kind of implied at the start that you suspected that we have 22,000 genes and there should be 22,000 diseases, right? But wouldn't you think from our, you know, knockout experiments in mice, et cetera, I mean, do you, do you think every gene will be associated with the disease? Well, so as I indicated, we think 15 to 30 percent will be embryonic lethal, so we'll never yeah. see viable humans uh, who have those mutations. But yeah, I think evolution is a pretty strong force, and uh, most genes are, are, that are not rapidly evolving and are, are you know, on their way to uh, extinction uh, are being maintained in the human population uh, uh, because of uh, selection. And uh, now, of course, the challenge is many of the phenotypes will only be displayed if you're in the right environment. Right. right? And so I think this gets back to the question of, uh, you know, if you were to pursue this, who should you be sequencing? Well, if you sequence healthy individuals, you're going to have a very difficult time appending a phenotype uh, uh, to those loss of function mutations uh, should you find them. So my personal bias is to start with individuals uh, who have significant medical illness, uh, pr particularly pr uh, preferentially those who uh, are, not, uh, di you know, are, not, are not already carrying uh, uh, an obvious diagnosis uh, that doesn't suggest uh, some genetic factor that you haven't already measured. Uh, but those are biases. I think there are different ways to skin a cat, and I think it'll require exp exploration to uh, see what works. So, Rick, sounds like the program's been spectacularly successful. Um, uh, but I, I'm intrigued as you think about looking out to non-coding, and then I'm also intrigued by, um, uh, and, there, and there could, of course, be many explanations for it. You said there are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of papers in the pipeline. A lot of uh, sort of hits that have been found and not yet published, and so it seems to me that your whole study, your whole study, will, um, you know, if somebody wanted to do a psychological analysis, I imagine there are publication biases in the, <laughs> and I'm thinking about interpretability, and um, you're in a sense, you and your colleagues are collecting very large numbers of variants in individuals who, a priori, I, I presume, have pretty high in according to everyone's reckonings, have a rather high likelihood of having a genetic etiology. Yep. And so, uh, and of course, my sense is the higher profile the publication, the greater the likelihood that one has found highly interpretable um, mutations. And so if you could speak to the <laughs> this question of the challenges of interpretability of the data that have arisen in the it, it was sort of a meta-analysis of, yeah. of the overall. Yeah. So I think it's a, I'll, I'll focus uh, uh, my comments on the uh, congenital malformations of cortical development uh, because there we have a really large data set of patients from consanguineous union uh, and uh, uh, Marat Ganell and Joe Gleason uh, have really contributed uh, a very large uh, uh, cohorts largely recruited from the Middle East uh, with consanguineous union. And uh, the state of uh, that analysis uh, is uh, there are, uh, there's an excess of genes hit more than once, uh, but there is a striking paucity of genes hit five times or ten times. We'd say, oh, this is, you know, an incredible slam dunk. So you're more in the uh, situation of realizing that there is likely very high locus heterogeneity. There are a lot of interesting genes in there. The best estimate is somewhere around uh, 75 from uh, Ganell's uh, uh, data set, which I'm most uh, familiar with. Uh, I would, you know, by analogy, Joe's uh, set is probably of similar size. Uh, and try thinking about how to deal with this uh, is, I think, an interesting one because it ultimately uh, pits the investigator's interest uh, a little bit counter to what might be the more public uh, uh, interest. And so one of the goals in the program uh, 
is to get this uh, data to the extent uh, possible, and that's dependent upon uh, the what's allowed by each IRB uh, uh, that uh, for which the sample was uh, approved uh, into the public uh, domain. So, <coughs> as as you might imagine. The investigators want to end up with a great paper where they've done functional analysis all the way down the line, uh, and that sometimes uh, runs counter to getting it out quickly, which uh, would be of uh, more general, uh, potentially of more general utility. There, of course, is nothing uh, wrong with having something that nails uh, something into the ground and says there's no question that this is the disease gene. And the two cell papers uh, that came out back to back uh, this month is a nice demonstration of very careful work. Two groups found nine families with the identical mutation, identical by descent, uh, independently did functional work that uh, uh, really characterized uh, the gene and its biochemistry uh, and its consequences. Uh, and balancing those, I think, is uh, a bit of an art form. Howard. Thank you very much. Uh, I, both during the concept clearance stage and, and in the kickoff stage at Council, uh, we heard about the European efforts and the Canadian efforts and these people's efforts and that people's efforts. And uh, the U.S. effort was tried to, was talked about, well, we'll take 200 of the genes or we'll take some number at that point that was being. How has it played out now in terms of both your interactions with the other places that are trying to do the same thing? And then also you've, um, you've alluded to maybe not really a network nature to this where two groups within the same network published two separate papers at the same time finding the same thing, which maybe that was data that was before the network started, but um, how, you know, how's this thing going in terms of a, the social uh, interactions of the thing? Yeah, so the sociology of this I think is, uh, is really quite interesting. Um, most of it is built on personal relationships that investigators within the network have with investigators all over the world. As I indicated, there are over 400 investigators who are ascertaining patients that are coming in to uh, uh, the CMGs. Most of those are uh, either one-offs of, I've got a small group of patients with a unique syndrome that uh, I think there are patients left uh, to have a diagnosis, uh, or they have a cohort of a particular type of patient uh, the uh, cortical malformations of the brain would be uh, a nice example where most of those samples have come from a small number of uh, individuals who have collected uh, uh, cohorts of these samples. So uh, it's, uh, it's largely uh, chance ascertainment, but it's chance that has been shaped by 20 years of prior experience of the investigators who are leading each of the CMGs. Uh, that they already have existing relationships uh, with people from around the world who uh, uh, typically have worked with uh, uh, us in the past. So uh, by its very nature, uh, it, is, it is not as coherently organized where you would say, let's open OMIM and just go down the list and you know, we'll take uh, A through L, you take uh, M through Z and we'll uh, go that way. Uh, it is by its nature a bit of uh, uh, a a disorganized free-for-all, and it was, a, I think, a happy occurrence that uh, the, because there's communication uh, among the groups, the two groups uh, said, I've got an interesting mutation in CLIP1. I've got an interesting mutation in CLIP1. Let's figure this out and uh, submit the, the manuscripts uh, together. Now, you might say, well, you know, everything should be just in one pot and uh, it should all be uh, shared. Uh, I think that argues against the way uh, scientists uh, are driven, right? People actually have personal interests. They pursue science because they're passionate about solving a particular problem. I'd be reluctant to try to suck all of that out and say, let's you know, make all of the data uh, immediately publicly available and thereby take away anybody's motivation to actually uh, uh, finish projects and publish them. Uh, but I think that's a balancing act as to how do you strike the right balance uh, between comp immediate, complete, open access of all of the data. I can tell you if uh, our collaborators uh, were required to make all of the data publicly available immediately, uh, it would be very difficult to uh, ha get any of them interested in uh, collaborating in the program. They, of course, want some time, and the negotiation has been how long should uh, people have to, uh, uh, to look at the data, and the, the number is six months right now. Rick, that was very nice, first of all. Um, I want to drill down a little deeper in the science of the um, somatic mutation. I mean, in each of the two examples you showed, we had a hook. 
you know, one was X-linked and the others, it was a skin phenotype. So you can see it, yep. like the colored hamsters or something. Is, is how do we systematically get a, get a handle on the role of somatic variation in human health and disease? Given that many of the tissues are inaccessible, we tend to rely on circulating lymphocytes, which every time I see these slides and we talk about it in the group, it makes me shudder that, you know, maybe we're not seeing the, the genomic DNA as it was inherited. Is, do you have a feeling of how we get at this more systematically and deeply? Well, so a, a great question. Uh, and of course, the challenge is if, you know, um, among the limitations that we have in medicine, aside from cancer, we rarely get tissue. And, uh, you know, I can tell you in the renal field, we don't biopsy kidneys almost ever anymore unless there's a very specific question that you want to answer. Uh, and uh, we're, I think it is the major limitation of humans, uh, wh which are otherwise a spectacular model system, if you will, uh, because we understand human physiology. We run circles around any model system uh, in terms of our level of understanding of human physiology and also, of course, the ability of the subject to tell you what's wrong with them. And uh, our mice are not very good at that. Our fish are really bad at that. Uh, and so we understand human phenotypes in ways that we can't begin to approach others. But, we do, but the major limitation is uh, exactly as you note, that uh, we do not routinely get tissue. Uh, and uh, it's chance ascertainment uh, if, when we do. And frequently, those aren't the patients that we're most interested uh, to get. I, and I wish there were a convenient way around that. But uh, it's, it's not obvious to me. Rick, can we, can we get, uh, can you clarify something for me? You talked before about whole genome versus whole exome, and you gave the example of if you go into OMIM and blah, 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 yeah. you only need a few hands or a couple hands to have all the cases that are, but, but isn't there an ascertainment bias there? I mean, there's still a lot no. of, wait a second, but in OMIM, there's a lot of conditions that are, that for which we still don't know the genomic basis, thousands, right, or hundreds, that's called, right, and so, do we know that those are going to reflect the ones where they are known and they may not? Maybe the reason they're not characterized yet is because it's harder to figure out what's wrong. So the question that I posed was if you take the loci that have been mapped by traditional linkage approaches, right, recessives, dominance, yeah. X-linked, and say how many of those after going through exomes do we not have an explanation for? The answer is extremely small. There are very few well-mapped loci where we don't know what the underlying basis is in a substantial fraction of the patients. You know, there are always, if for any protein coding, any gene that is, uh, pr has a protein coding mutation that causes a disease, there are about 15% of the alleles that you never find by sequencing uh, the coding region. Uh, and those presumably are deep intronic mutations or promoter and enhancer mutations, and those are quite plausible. But there are very few right? Uh, hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin uh, is, uh, you know, one example. And there are a handful of examples uh, uh, where the mutations are exclusively in non-coding uh, regions uh, based on linkage studies. So uh, I am not holding my breath that so we're you, going so to So if I understand that, you're excited about the prospects of doing some whole genome sequencing in a subset of these cases, but you're not optimistic that that's going to solve a lot of them. Un unless they're hiding under the, uh, these de novo, you know, de novo mutations that we never would have mapped that uh, escaped uh, uh, all of the traditional mapping approaches. I, I think those will not turn out to be uh, a common cause of uh, uh, Mendelian disease. Do, do you see it? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's no, right. No, go ahead. Bob do, do you a see a potentially kind of interesting paradox in what you just said, which I don't doubt at all, and the fact that so many of the relevant GWAS hits are in non-coding, seem to be non-coding. Oh, so I think that's a great point. So uh, one potential explanation for that. So, so the paradox would be if the GWAS uh, hits are all pointing to Mendelian loci, uh, we must be really bad geneticists not to have recognized the underlying Mendelian loci uh, all these, low these many years. Uh, and so that's one. Uh, and I think perhaps the explanation is many of the GWAS uh, loci point to the only mutations that you could get at a locus uh, that are compatible with survival. So one possibility is that uh, these variants only occur in regulatory sequences uh, because if you had large effect mutations, they'd be lethals and uh, we'd never see them. And again, another limitation of human biology that we're not very good at capturing lethal alleles. Bob, you want to just go up to a microphone at the table and push a button? 
You're allowed from the peanut gallery. Yeah. Sure. So, Rick, it seems like a lot of these projects are international. And on your last point of data sharing and all that, I was just wondering if this is the direction we're going into global science and all that. Is there anything we should be paying attention to about sharing of data, IRB, ethics review, any issues that have emerged that we should be paying more attention to? Well, it, it is certainly clear that the international standards for uh, IRB are very different than uh, uh, what we have evolved in the United States. And uh, our IRB uh, issues it, it had significant impact uh, historically over uh, uh, ability to maintain insurability and employability. Uh, and those are not issues that uh, typically arise in other parts of the world that have nationalized uh, healthcare systems. So some of the issues are qualitatively different uh, in the United States uh, versus internationally. So, uh, so there is heterogeneity, and I think some of the heterogeneity is uh, uh, a, a social construct that uh, probably should not concern us uh, too much. But I think there are uh, requirements that uh, we try to uh, keep the same standards internationally for uh, protection of uh, human rights that uh, uh, we would subscribe to uh, in the United States. And I think those are, are critical. On the data sharing side, um, I hope that uh, the other groups get as far along as we are because I think it will be great benefit to us. So as I mentioned, we've got a lot of interesting singletons that we can't, uh, that we, you know, again, uh, as we said earlier in uh, the previous session, uh, where you look at a mutation and say, oh, I bet that uh, causes this disease, but you've only got uh, one uh, uh, allele or one muta uh, homozygous mutation uh, to work from. Uh, whereas if somebody else found another one, uh, that would strengthen the case enormously, or, or if two other groups found independent mutations in the same gene. And that's where I think data sharing will make a very big uh, difference. And uh, in the CMG, the uh, group at Johns Hopkins has uh, uh, come up with uh, a matchmaker uh, algorithm where you put uh, your gene uh, onto, a, onto a server. You don't disclose anything about what the phenotype is. We just say, I've got an interesting mutation uh, uh, in this gene or in this phenotype. Anybody else have uh, anything that uh, matches that that they'd care to uh, uh, exchange data with? And uh, this matchmaking platform, I think, has some potential to uh, uh, try to provide a path forward where you could turn these singletons uh, into uh, things that might uh, more quickly uh, turn into uh, genes that you uh, really could say you've solved something. And I actually had a slide about that in my director's report this morning, talking about this program you guys put out on the web. Other questions for Rick? Simple-minded question, probably not a simple answer. What's completing us? What's keeping us from completing the catalog here, defining all Mendelian disease? Yeah. So, uh, ascertainment, right, takes uh, scaling up uh, the collection of uh, patients and dollars. And the good news is uh, the cost keeps coming down, right? As you know, with uh, the next generation of instruments, uh, once we uh, get to a point where uh, we can sequence uh, on the new Illumina platform and do exomes, despite what they might want us uh, to do with uh, the data, it's going to cost about $200 to do uh, an exome. There's still marginal benefit uh, to doing that over uh, doing whole genomes if you're looking for protein coding variants. So I think uh, this will be with us uh, for a while, although I remain enthusiastic about whole genomes. Uh, so barrier is cost and, uh, and patience. And, um, you know, we've, I think in the CMGs, we under-budgeted initially for ascertainment with the hope that uh, the web portal would provide a huge influx uh, of patients. And we realized uh, about halfway through year one that that simply was not going to happen. And so we really had to scale up uh, our ascertainment. Uh, and that really has been uh, ramping up. And you know, now uh, going forward, uh, our ascertainment is roughly matching uh, our capacity. Uh, so we're in pretty good shape for uh, collectively sequencing uh, uh, somewhere around 6,000 exomes uh, uh, for the ne each of the next uh, two years in this program. Uh, but uh, I, I do think it's something that uh, we really you know, ought to be getting on with. I think it uh, it's clearly has to be part of the to-do list in uh, genetics and genomics. Rick, was that your biggest disappointment, in your opinion, over the last two and a half years, that you didn't get bigger 
people or a greater number of people coming to you? Or was there another, was, was there anything else on that disappointment list? Because obviously lots of things have gone really well. No, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I can't say anyone in the program was really surprised because uh, most of us who have done uh, human genetics have uh, realized that, uh, you know, this is uh, a retail business. It's built on personal relationships. People want to work with people who they know and, uh, and have built a level of trust with if you're going to, yeah. you know, send samples uh, halfway around the world. Uh, and that's very hard to replace with uh, a web portal. So I don't think that came a, as a great surprise. Uh, but I think uh, it, you know the program uh, is is doing very well now on the recruitment side, and interesting things are coming in or being discovered. So uh, I, I've, I've got very few complaints. Time to put you back on council, Rick. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, then I can complain. That would be a complaint. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Rick.